You know, man, it's it's quite hilarious. It is so funny how people expect. They expect me to shit all over something, even when it's good on the main roster. I put a tweet out right before I hit record for this particular review of the Survivor Series, and people are up in arms about my positive tweet for the Survivor Series this year. All I all I tweeted out was hashtag Survivor Series was the best main roster pay-per-view of 2018. People claiming that Evolution was better. People arguing with me that the Royal Rumble was better, that Hell in a Cell was better, that Money in the Bank was better. And people are making fun of me. Well, JD likes something on the main roster. Are you okay? Are you drunk? You do realize this is not NXT. Do you guys think I want to sit here every single week and complain about the main roster? Do you guys think I want to sit here every single week and complain about how bad Monday Night Raw is and how SmackDown doesn't utilize their roster completely on a weekly basis? You want me to bitch and moan? I'm not going to do that. You'll get some of that tonight, but what you're going to get tonight is overwhelmingly positive. Survivor Series was great tonight. Now, we all know that Monday Night Raw is not the superior brand, so them winning Survivor Series this year 6-0 to is a fucking joke. We all know that SmackDown Live, by default, is the better show. Monday Night Raw has been goddamn horrendous every single week for the majority of the year. So, that is a little misleading, if you ask me. But hopefully... That 6-0 to zero win by Monday Night Raw plays into an overall greater storyline for this show. Because there's no way anybody's believing that Monday Night Raw is the better show over SmackDown Live. That's just fucking ludicrous. But the Survivor Series has been something that, that we could really sink our teeth into every November. And it's resulted in some of the best pay-per-views with some of the best matches for the last couple years on the main roster for WWE. Now, we all know the brand split. And the, I would say, the overall feel of the brand split has pretty much diminished in everybody's eyes. Monday Night Raw at three hours, they have no roster. It's the same shit every fucking week. The brand split has done nothing to enhance Monday Night Raw. SmackDown Live at two hours is the much better show, but they don't utilize half of the roster that they do have. Nobody is really living the brand split right now in WWE. But every year. We get the Survivor Series every November, and it's the Raw versus SmackDown theme. And what has resulted has been the best pay-per-view of the main roster for the last couple years for WWE, and tonight was no different. Tonight was a great fucking show. Yes, there were some cringe moments. Yes, there were some moments that made me scratch my head, but the overall feel of tonight's show was that WWE delivered their best main roster pay-per-view of 2018, and we have more questions than we do answers coming out of tonight's show. And for a stale WWE product right now, I think that's the best fucking thing to get people interested going on into the last pay-per-view of 2018 before we hit the Royal Rumble. This is what was needed. We needed some sort of excitement coming out of this show, and WWE delivered I'm not going to sit here and sugarcoat anything. I'm not going to sit here and lie to everybody watching me. Tonight was a damn good show. And the unpredictability and the storylines coming out of tonight's show are ones that I'm actually interested in. So I thought overall it was a win-win situation for WWE. So we're going to go over everything tonight for the Survivor Series 2018 that was topped off by a great main event with Brock Lesnar and Daniel Bryan. We had a great Ronda Rousey versus Charlotte match. Shinsuke Nakamura and Seth Rollins tore the house down. Buddy Murphy and Mustafa Ali maximized the, the amount of time that they got to deliver a great cruiserweight match. The Raw versus SmackDown men's match was really entertaining, even though towards the end it got a little bit boring. But the overall feel of the show was a positive one coming from me. So we're going to go over all that and everything else that happened on the Survivor Series tonight in this review. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I am JD from New York. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for all notifications, man. I would really appreciate it. We just hit 101,000 
subscribers, man. So please hit that subscribe button. If you guys have been here for, for a little bit, joining me on the podcast, man, thank you guys so much for all your love and support. Follow me on Twitter, at JD from NY206, and follow me on Patreon, man. If you guys want to pledge and support the podcast on Patreon, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. If you guys missed my NXT TakeOver War Games review from last night's absolutely fantastic NXT show, the best takeover show that they've ever produced, one of the best shows that WWE has ever produced, period. NXT TakeOver War Games 2, that review is live on the channel right now, so please make sure you guys go and check that out. That will be linked in the annotation that you see in the top right corner of your screen. Man, let's hit this Survivor Series. I am going to start off with something that really bothered me right from the get-go, okay? Okay. And I know I'm not the only one who felt this way. And i seen a few people make mention of it after I had even written it in my notes. And I'm like, thank God I'm not the only one who's feeling this way, man. What is it with WWE having these wrestlers go out there and perform in Raw or SmackDown branded plain vanilla red and blue t-shirts? Can someone please tell me how that is aesthetically pleasing to a viewer at home or someone watching in the audience. Do you know how ridiculous it is to watch Charlotte Flair wrestle a match with Ronda Rousey, probably the biggest match of both of their careers, wearing Raw and, uh, and SmackDown branded t-shirts? Now, Ronda didn't wear a Raw t-shirt. Some of the bigger names didn't have to wear a Raw t-shirt, so why did everybody else have to? Ronda didn't wear a Raw t-shirt. She came out wearing the color red, mixed with her usual outfit. Charlotte was wearing a fucking SmackDown t-shirt. Now, we all know, if you watch the program on a week-to-week basis, you know that Charlotte's on SmackDown and Ronda's on Raw. Do you know how ridiculous it is to watch Shinsuke Nakamura wrestle Seth Rollins in a fucking blue SmackDown Live t-shirt? I don't know what the fuck he was wearing, but that shit was not aesthetically pleasing to the eye. I found it to be quite ridiculous, if you ask me. There's nothing wrong with representing your brand, but it's got to be done the right way. Mix the colors into your outfit and make the outfit stand out, whether it be blue or red. We don't need people wearing t-shirts. For the people, for the majority of the people watching this show, you know who's associated with what brand. So right out of the gate, I'm like, what what am I watching here? Half the fucking members in the tag team match that opened the the pre-show, were wearing branded t-shirts. Charlotte was wearing a branded t-shirt. Nakamura was wearing a branded t-shirt. It's ridiculous. Then you got guys like Brock Lesnar. Lesnar's not going to come out wearing a fucking Raw t-shirt. Daniel Bryan wasn't wearing a SmackDown t-shirt. Ronda Rousey wasn't wearing a SmackDown t-shirt. A Raw t-shirt, rather. Uh, You had Seth Rollins. He wasn't wearing a Raw t-shirt. He wasn't wearing a Raw t-shirt at all. He mixed the Raw colors into his normal outfit. So, right out of the gate, that was one of the things that kind of irked me, and WWE has done that the last couple of years. So, I hope that if we continue to do this Survivor Series theme with Raw vs. SmackDown, that they somehow get rid of that cheesiness that is the Raw and SmackDown branded t-shirts. Now, the pre-show started off with the Tag Team Survivor Series Raw vs. SmackDown match. Every tag team associated with Raw and SmackDown In one match. I expected fucking chaos. I expected this to really be a shit show. And what we got towards the end of this match was actually pretty damn surprising. It actually ended up being a a decent match when all is said and done. So, right out of the gate. My first note here is the match looks absolutely ridiculous. Now, I don't like this match regardless. No matter how good the ending was... I don't like this type of match regardless because teams that have not even been featured, and I mean all year, teams that have not been featured all year are somehow in this match and WWE expects the audience sitting in attendance and the people watching at home to care about the fucking Colognes and the Ascension and the B team. Who who gives a shit? Sanity? Who gives a shit about these teams if they're not featured all year? Why, because Survivor Series comes around, you need bodies to fill a meaningless tag team match? And by the way, SmackDown won this match, and this win didn't even register on the scoreboard for SmackDown Live at the end of the night. 
So, side note, when Road Dog wants to say, what's the difference with the pre-show? It's all the same show. No, it's not. It's definitely not. So, you didn't count SmackDown's win in this particular match to add to their overall score, which would have made it not a shutout. And all the effort by these guys on SmackDown Live to win this match and give me a hard-fought match for the blue team ended up being a complete waste of time. So when WWE wants to say the pre-show is actually part of the main show and whatever analyst in the community wants to say, well, the pre-show is part of the main show. No, it's not. The pre-show is not a part of the main show. It never will be and it never was. This is the absolute personification of that being true. No, it's not. So right out of the gate, okay? That was the sidebar. Let's get back to the match. Too many bodies in this. It looked ridiculous having all these guys stand on the fucking apron. And being that this is the Survivor Series, you figured it's a pay-per-view where individuals or certain members of a team or a tag team have the opportunity to break out. And a match like this really doesn't give nearly enough time for any of those irrelevant teams or names to showcase anything that they have to break out. So, I don't like this match to begin with. I I stressed this on SmackDown Live Review weeks before the pay-per-view even happened. You you should do two teams versus two teams. You take the two best teams on Raw and the two best teams on SmackDown Live and you put them in an elimination match. You know how ridiculous it is when you got all these teams, you got five teams on each apron from each brand, and if a member of a team is pinned, then his team is gone. I fucking hate that ruling. It should have been the best two teams from both brands competing in a competitive Survivor Series match. Single elimination. But WWE is too thick-headed to think that far ahead. Or give me a decent match. They gotta get everybody on the show for the sake of getting everybody on the show because it's Survivor Series and it's a dual-branded effort. No. I wish things would change for the better, going on into the future. But I know that they won't. So, right out of the gate, Dash Wilder and Scott Dawson delivered a shatter machine to Primo of the Colognes. And now I'm not talking about Primo Hoagies. I'm talking about Primo of the Colognes. Yes, he is still employed by WWE. I guess the timeshare business in Puerto Rico isn't going too well. So he made his way over to LA to hopefully land some new deals. The Colognes were eliminated within three minutes, exactly proving my point. How are you going to get a team like the the Colognes on Survivor Series and get me to care about them when all you're going to do is use them as, I, I, I guess, bodies, irrelevant bodies, for the sake of filling up a match? Three minutes eliminated. Goodbye. Go back to the timeshare business and maybe you'll, I guess, get a two-star rating on Travelocity instead of one. So, they're gone. The club eliminated the B-team when Gallows pinned Bo Dallas. Who cares? The B-team is absolutely irrelevant. Bo Dallas, out of everybody on this show, needs a fucking refresh. You got Bray Wyatt doing nothing. Luke Harper, ready to come back any day now. Right? Eric Rowan, probably on his way back within the next couple of months. Get the Wyatt family back together. And bring me Brother Bray and Brother Bo. That's the best thing to do with Bo Dallas, but there's not a single creative cell in WWE's body. Or the people in creative, they don't have a fucking single creative brain cell in their head. It's ridiculous. Who gives a shit about the B team? Gallows and Anderson eliminate the B team. Good for them. It's probably the the biggest thing that they did all year. Sanity, sanity, sanity. They were eliminated by Bobby Roode and Chad Gable when Roode and Gable actually had a decent showing in this match. Believe it or not, after all the shit that we talked about with Bobby Roode and Chad Gable and when Bobby Roode's going to turn on Chad Gable and when he's going to go back to being the glorious dick, they they actually had a decent showing in this match. Uh, Sanity completely buried. There is absolutely no hope for Sanity on the main roster. Yet, people are still calling for Nikki Cross to join Sanity on the main roster. Why? So that she can sit next to them in catering for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time? Sanity, absolutely irrelevant on the main roster. Speaking of which, Lars Sullivan 
Lars Sullivan is now on the main roster. You believe that? Lars Sullivan demoted to either Raw or SmackDown. We don't know which brand he's going to be on. So he he was he I guess he had like coming attractions. They had a like a, a little highlight reel for Lars Sullivan, all the work he did in NXT. Now he's coming to the main roster. Didn't they learn by calling up talent from NXT how bad some of these talents are going to be treated on the main roster? They didn't learn from Nia Jax how Lars Sullivan, still green in the ring, but though he has the potential to break out, now they're bringing him to the main roster. I don't know where he's going to land, but I have no hope for Lars Sullivan. Look at everybody else before him. There's rarely any NXT talent that makes the main roster that's going to do anything. So, how can I get excited about watching Lars Sullivan compete in NXT and then join the main roster and then die after two months? Absolutely ridiculous. Look at Sanity. Point proven. Sanity was eliminated by Bobby Roode and Chad Gable when they did a neckbreaker moonsault combination on Eric Young. Sanity is as irrelevant than anyone I have ever seen on the main roster, and I have zero hope for Lars Sullivan on either Raw or SmackDown Live. The New Day, they eliminated the Ascension when Xavier Woods lifted Big E up on his shoulders in an electric chair position and slammed him down onto Victor. So there goes the Ascension. Thank you for coming. Lucha House Party, they eliminated Gallows and Anderson. Thank you for coming. I hope you book your flight back to New Japan at some point in 2019. Grand Metallic walked a tightrope off the top rope with a beautiful senton splash. That was that. Usos, they eliminated the Lucha House Party when Jimmy Uso slammed Lince Dorado right on top of his head with a half-assed Samoan slam. That's what it looked like to me. And it was some sort of miscommunication. So the Usos eliminated the Lucha House Party and Jimmy eliminated Lince Dorado. Chad Gable executed a beautiful Exploder Suplex on Big E. He and Rude tried a double team on Big E with a German Suplex Neckbreaker combination for a two count that was almost an opportunity to eliminate the New Day. Xavier Woods and Big E then with a Uranagi backstabber combo in the corner on Rude for a close two count. Gable then leaped over the referee, actually involved the referee in breaking up the pin. I think he attacked the referee more so than he did the the pin. Uh, He jumped over the referee to break up the pinfall. Things are breaking down completely. Everyone is flying all over each other on the outside. Rude was about to do a suicide dive on the outside until Jey Uso super kicked Rude and decided to fly on top of everyone himself. So he took out Rude and then jumped on everybody with a suicide dive on the outside. Chad Gable, German suplex. This was one of the best spots of the entire pay-per-view. Chad Gable, German suplex, Jey Uso, off the top rope to the outside on top of everyone And it was honestly some scary shit because it looked like Jay's head actually nailed someone on the way down. I don't know who it was, but that shit looked fucking scary, man. So Jay really, really, really had to trust Chad Gable in that spot. And I've never seen that done before, but it looked pretty damn fucking brutal from where I was sitting. Gable and Rude were then eliminated by the New Day when the New Day delivered the midnight hour for the pin. So we're down to the Revival the Usos, and the New Day. The Revival get the Shatter Machine on Xavier Woods. Xavier Woods went up to the top to deliver his springboard elbow, and he came off the top rope and was hit with a Shatter Machine. So now we're down to the Usos and the Revival. The Revival pulled out the Steiner Brothers' old finishing move where we had Scott Steiner usually lifting up someone in an electric chair position, and Rick Steiner would come off the top with the big bulldog off of Scott Steiner's shoulders. They did that, And they got a very, very close near fall on the Usos. Super, uh, I think it was, um, what what happened here? Dawson, we had come off the top rope with a big splash. um, Or Wilder it was. Wilder came off the top rope with a big splash. And the Usos started to fight back with super kicks. Jimmy then came off the top rope. And he did the big splash with another homage to Roman Reigns with the big splash. And they get the victory for SmackDown Live, which honestly counted for zero. It was a complete waste of time by the Usos winning this. 
but the SmackDown side wins the tag team elimination match. If this doesn't get you interested in a revival, revival, I don't know what to tell you, man. This team is absolutely being wasted on the main roster. They need to start doing something with them ASAP. Get them off of Raw and put them on SmackDown Live because I would pay money to see a Revival versus a New Day or a Revival versus the Usos for the SmackDown Live Tag Team Championships. I, I've been saying this for months. I, I, can't even, I can't even fucking stress this enough. The Tag Team division on both shows is, is being completely wasted. There's no teams on Monday Night Raw that I give a shit about. The AOP has no challenges for that title. And SmackDown Live... You either get the Usos, the New Day, or the Bar. Everybody else seems to be completely out of the picture. Merge these divisions together. Get some quality matches out of the Revival. Get some quality matches out of AOP. And then you might have something there. We need some sort of tag team resurgence in WWE, both on Raw and SmackDown Live. The only thing that I could think of is either bring up some teams from NXT that you're not going to really be utilizing down there, that are not going to factor into anything, or merge these fucking divisions and get rid of one title and only have one title for everybody to fight over. I I don't understand why there's such a lack of tag team wrestling when you got teams like The Revival and The Usos who clearly can put on a match of the night any day of the week. Please, get The Revival back in a major program for some sort of championship. They are too good to be wasted away on Monday Night Raw. Actually, a very, very good match at the end of it. Uh, obviously, when it came down to teams like the Revival and the New Day and the Usos, you know, it's going to get good. They eliminated all the, all, all the shitty teams, and then they gave us the actual teams that know how to work. So SmackDown wins here and realistically goes up 1-0 on Monday Night Raw. Pay-per-view. Survivor Series started off with the Women's Survivor Series match. This match had absolutely zero heat. This match had zero heat going into it. I didn't give a shit about this match. I think everybody was very curious about how Nia Jax would be received in this match after what happened on Monday Night Raw with Becky Lynch. Clearly, clearly, a week removed when everybody was calling for Nia Jax to be terminated, Nia Jax to be suspended, Nia Jax to be buried, clearly removed a week from the incident with Becky Lynch it's paying off for both women. Becky Lynch is, is going to be better off for it, even though she was not at the Survivor Series tonight. Becky Lynch is going to be better off for it. Nia Jax is going to be better off for it. WWE, the best thing for them to do right now is play off what happened. You could be pissed at Nia Jax. WWE could be pissed at Nia Jax. But what WWE needs to do which is best for business right now, is build Nia Jax up and play off the fact that she injured Becky Lynch. And they've done that so far. She's now using the nickname Facebreaker. And I think it's absolutely fucking brilliant. Now, we all hate Nia Jax. We all think Nia Jax is very, very subpar in the ring. She should not be in a ring. She should be down at the Performance Center enhancing her skills in the ring. We all know this. But the fact that WWE had this incident happen... There's no better business move than to play off what happened to Becky Lynch. And now, for the first time in almost forever since Nia Jax has been with the WWE, she is now getting organic reactions that are genuine to the character that she's portraying on television. People booed the shit out of Nia Jax, and it was absolutely fucking music to my ears. Remember what I talked about on Off the Script? You put Nia Jax in this position and you build her up as a fucking I don't give a shit heel. When Becky Lynch is healed up, you put Nia Jax in the Royal Rumble with Becky Lynch as the final two competitors with Becky Lynch winning the Royal Rumble. That's what I would do. Clearly, before that, Becky Lynch would have to be stripped of the, stripped of the championship, but that's exactly what I'd do. The moment that would be created in that situation would be fucking epic. So hopefully WWE goes through with building this up and using this real-life situation as a way to make Becky look even better in the end. And Nia is benefiting from it as well by getting real, genuine reaction to the character that she's portraying on television. Like I said, first thing in my notes, Nia Jax completely got shit on by the fans in LA for what happened to Becky Lynch. Sasha Banks 
and Bailey were added as replacements for Ruby Riot and Natalia. Now, apparently, they were fighting over the issues with Jim the Anvil Neidhart's glasses from a few weeks ago on Raw. That was WWE's way of most likely, and I put this in my notes, WWE's way of most likely responding to the backlash that you have a women's division with a elimination match with both divisions on both shows, not represented by two women who realistically are the evolution of women's wrestling right now, or at least what remains of it. There's no way you're going to have a women's Survivor Series match and not have Sasha Banks and Bayley represent your team. So I don't know what WWE did here, but the only thing I could think of is, I don't know why you wouldn't have Ruby Riot on your team. You know, Natalia, you, you could make a case for Natalia being one of the founding members of the Evolution as well, but it looks like they were the two expendable ones here for Sasha Banks and Bayley. I think, I think honestly, if I was to choose a excuse, I think a lot of people made a big stink over Sasha Banks and Bayley not being in the match at Survivor Series and not being on the Survivor Series card, period. So that's the only thing I could really think of. Naomi and Tamina start the match off. Huge Becky chance with Tamina in there. Obviously, Becky wasn't there. Tamina started shit with the women on the apron. So she's in the ring and she's going over to the SmackDown side and she's shoving people off the apron, punching people off the apron. And things broke down with all 10 women at that moment beating the shit out of each other. Tamina then eliminates Naomi very, very quickly after she gave uh, Naomi, uh, I believe she, Naomi gave Naya on the apron on Raw side a step up in Seguri, and then Tamina caught her immediately when she turned around with a super kick. Tamina then was quickly eliminated herself by Carmella who came in and rolled up Tamina without her knowing. So from behind, she rolled up Tamina with a 1-2-3. So Tamina was eliminated. By the way, Tamina came out to fucking funeral silence, as always. Nobody gives a shit about Tamina Snuka. Asuka and Mickey went head-to-head to a nice ovation. This was actually a rematch of sorts from NXT TakeOver Toronto, I believe. So, these two women are no strangers to one another. Asuka gets a very nice reaction all night. And I hope WWE starts listening and gets that woman back into a major program and starts to feature her regularly like she should be on SmackDown Live. Mandy Rose was actually added to the SmackDown team as the fifth member. Typical WWE lack of creative. They gave you the the very lackluster edition of a mystery woman. M- Mandy Rose was announced on the pre-show, so Mandy Rose eliminated Mickey James when Sonya Deville did damage, and Mandy Rose took advantage by tagging herself in and pinning Mickey James. So at that point, it makes SmackDown 4 and Raw 3. Bailey delivers a Bailey to Belly on Carmella, and Carmella is eliminated. Now we're tied up 3 to 3. Sasha Banks comes in after Bailey tagged out against Mandy Rose and eliminated Mandy Rose with a bank statement. Mandy Rose taps out very quickly. Raw up 3 to 2. Asuka and Sonya Deville were the only ones remaining for SmackDown Live. They were working on Sasha Banks and until Sasha Banks makes a tag to Bailey. Bailey delivers a back suplex on Deville for a very close two count. Deville and then Bailey going at it. Um, Bailey is nailed with a spine buster by Deville. Two count. Nia Jax runs in to break up the pin. So Nia Jax is in the ring. She breaks up the pin. Sonya Deville throws her into the ring post. And Asuka kicks Jax right in the face as she's hanging off the middle turnbuckle onto the steel post. Banks ends up roll, um, nailing a Meteora from the apron to Asuka on the floor. So things are start, starting to break down here. Bailey spears DeVille to the outside and continued to fight on the outside until the referee counted both of them out. Neither of them made the referee's 10 count. So now it's Asuka all by herself against Sasha Banks and Nia Jax. Are we going to have flashes of deja vu from last year where Asuka won the entire thing for SmackDown Live? A lot of people were calling for this. A lot of people were stating on social media this would be a great way to get Asuka built back up for SmackDown Live. So we get the double count out. Neither of them made the 10 count, Bailey and DeVille. 
Asuka and Sasha Banks had a great back and forth and actually got some time in the ring together to get some shit in. And all I'm thinking at this point is, damn, this would be a good fucking title feud. Damn, a show, whether it's Raw or SmackDown, I could easily see these two women leading the main women's program on that show. Do you know how great it would be? And this is what I was thinking during these two in the ring. How great it would be for Sasha Banks to go over to SmackDown Live and have a program with Asuka over the women's championship. It it would be fucking great. And and another thing, I, I mentioned the tag team division, how you should fuse those divisions together. The same thing could be done with the women. We need fresh matchups in the women's division. This is something that I want to see more of. After these two women were in the ring and done, all I wanted to see was more Asuka and more Sasha Banks. I think they work absolutely fucking fantastic together. Asuka nailed a huge knee to Sasha Banks. And that was followed up by a German release suplex that nearly folded Sasha Banks in half, man. I thought she was literally broken in half. Sasha continued to fight out of an Asuka lock that Asuka soon then tried to apply. She tried to escape with a reversal and a pin combo. That same pin combo that usually that we that we've been seeing with Shayna Baszler and Kyrie Sane. So she tried that pinning combination and reversal. Asuka kicked out. She hits the flying knees in the corner. She hits the meteor in the corner and climbs up top until all of a sudden, Nia Jax shoves Sasha Banks off the top rope. Asuka then applies the Asuka lock and Banks taps out to Asuka. Nia Jax then comes in and she finishes Asuka off with not one, not two, but three leg drops and she wins for Monday Night Raw as she is serenaded in booze from the Staples Center, man. So they're building Nia Jax up and this is a natural progression of what they're doing because she does have a match with Ronda Rousey at TLC. So that's what they're doing there. So I'm not surprised that they did this. I, I'm kind of upset that it happened to Asuka, but at the same time, I'm not. Asuka had a good showing tonight. I'm not going to sit here and be completely pissed off at the fact that Asuka was pinned by Nia Jax. I thought Asuka had a very nice showing, and the fact that she lasted on Team SmackDown Live as the only member for her team. And she had a great showing against Sasha Banks. So... I'm going to take this as baby steps for Asuka here at the Survivor Series. Monday Night Raw wins the Women's Survivor Series match. No heat with it. You know, the match was pretty much a, you know, afterthought. The only thing that that we could think of is Becky. People were chanting for Becky. And the fact that Nia Jax is coming out of this looking good as well. So Nia Jax is getting some genuine heel heat for the character that she's portraying on Monday Night Raw. And that's all that could really matter right now because it's going to make Becky Lynch's comeback that much more satisfying in the end. So we'll see what happens with Nia Jax. Asuka gets pinned by Nia to win it for Team Raw. Seth Rollins versus Shinsuke Nakamura. This was a match, first time ever, that I was looking forward to here. I was anticipating a Dean Ambrose appearance here in this match, and we did not get one single peep from Dean Ambrose at the Survivor Series. The only mention of Dean Ambrose that we got tonight is that it is indeed booked for TLC. The Intercontinental title will be on the line. Seth Rollins will defend against Dean Ambrose at TLC. So it's going to be those two in the ring after everything that's transpired with Dean Ambrose heel turn. Shinsuke wrestled in a blue SmackDown Live t-shirt and he looked absolutely fucking atrocious. Uh, I mentioned this in the beginning. There are, and it's in my notes for this match. It's one thing that I was just thinking of the entire night. I know it's something that I'm nitpicking on, but it makes everybody look ridiculous who's actually partaking in this garbage. There are ways for the for the performers to not look so cheesy by simply wearing blue or red attire. You know, change it up, make it look a little different for the Survivor Series. At this point, I think the fans know who's on which brand. So it's an aesthetic thing that to me is very important that makes the superstars stand out instead of looking cheesy. That's just me. I don't know what you guys think about that. This match was fucking fantastic. You know, LA did not do these guys justice. I think LA could have treated these guys a little bit better than they did when this match was over. You know, uh, another reason why I think the brand split needs to come to an end. They told a great story in the ring, a story of two guys who will not give up, matched equally together, going blow for blow. 
if I had one criticism about this match is the fact that it started off slow, but I understand by the end of this thing why they did what they did. And the crowd actually reacted in a very negative manner to the match starting off slow with chants of, this is boring. I don't know why you would be chanting, this is boring, for a Seth Rollins match against Shinsuke Nakamura, a highly anticipated match between an IC champion and a US champion that we've never seen before in a WWE ring. So the LA crowd could have treated them a little bit better. So I didn't like that at all. The crowd needed to be louder. Because the amount of work that we got from both of these guys, you know, was ridiculous. They gave us a damn good match. And L.A., for at least the first half of it, didn't really treat this guy, these guys with the proper respect. That's the only criticism I give this match. Nakamura with strikes in the corner, but Rollins turns it around and ends up dropping Nakamura on the apron. After blocking a kick, Nakamura comes back and drops Rollins with a step up in Suguri from the outside as Rollins tried to do a suicide dive. That stopped his momentum and that really stopped Rollins for the majority of the first half of this match. Nakamura then unloads with stomps in the corner and the referee is telling him to just calm his shit. Rollins backs uh, or comes back swinging. They start brawling. Rollins unloads against the ropes, stomps away. Referee also backs him off. They're going tit for tat here. Nakamura counters a short arm clothesline and drops Rollins into a triangle choke. Rollins finally powers up and turns that into a buckle bomb on Nakamura. Rollins then is gearing up for the stomp. He's doing his little uh, pre-stomp, you know, I guess HBK-like uh, stomps to the ring. Chance of burn it down. Rollins kicks Nakamura in the gut, but Nakamura rocks him in the face with a boot. Rollins comes back with a forearm, Nakamura with a headbutt. Nakamura then drives Rollins into the mat with some sort of power bomb and holds it for a two count. I think they called it the landslide. It, look, it almost looked like a Michinoku driver, but they called it the landslide. Nakamura goes to the top turnbuckle, but Rollins ends up hitting his superplex into the Falcon Arrow. Rollins holds that for a two count. They get up, trade some big shots in the middle of the ring. Nakamura gets the upper hand and nails a kick to the back of the neck. Nakamura then with the reverse exploder. He charges for a Kinshasa, uh, Kin, Kin, Kinshasa. I can't even fucking talk. But hits the turnbuckle instead. Rollins drops Nakamura with the ripcord knee. But Nakamura kicks out just in time after a close near fall. Rollins flies for the frog splash off the top rope. Misses. Nakamura moves out of the way. Nakamura comes back with another Kinshasa for a two count. Nakamura then readies for a third Kinshasa. Rollins gets up very slowly, meets him in the middle of the ring with a big super kick. Rollins misses the stomp. Nakamura drops him to the back of the head. Rollins avoids a Kinshasa and hits the stomp in the end for the win. Seth Rollins beats Shinsuke Nakamura. No sign of Dean Ambrose. Clean at the Survivor Series. Great match. And now that moves Rollins on to Dean Ambrose and Nakamura. I don't really know where he goes for SmackDown Live. I don't really know what they do with him. We'll see what happens. I do know Nakamura has a contract coming up in January. I would be, at this point, I would be shocked if Nakamura stays with the WWE. So we'll see what happens with that. But this was a great match. Only criticism is that the fans didn't really treat these guys with the proper respect in the first half of this match. They did turn it up in the closing 10 minutes of this match. So they had a great match. One of the best matches of the night, for sure, at the Survivor Series. Authors of Pain versus The Bar. I was actually looking forward to this, but this match was completely fucking ruined because Enzo Amore was sitting second row, hard camera side, and he was sitting there with a hoodie on, thinking nobody realized who he was. There were screenshots of Twitter, close up, people taking pictures at home on the TV, saying that they, that they think it's Enzo Amore. People realized this was Enzo Amore during this match. I believe he paid for a ticket to sit there. All of a sudden, when this match starts, Enzo is getting up in his seat. He's got a bright blue, I believe, Enzo and Cass t-shirt on. And he's got his fucking blonde hair flapping in the fucking staple center. You knew it was him. He's doing his dance in the aisleway. All of a sudden, we see a flock of security guards come and drag him out of the staple center. 
and more people were obsessed with Enzo being there, chanting for Enzo, chanting for him to come back, than the bar and the authors of Pain Mash. So Enzo was sitting second row. You can clearly see him. Baby blue t-shirt, hair flapping in the wind in the Staples Center. Not sure what happened, but it was then revealed that he was kicked out of the Staples Center. Fans chanting, how you doing? And then the fans started to chant, we want Enzo. This completely took the crowd out of the match between the bar and the authors of pain that had absolutely no momentum whatsoever going into it. So it wasn't beach balls tonight, Cesaro. It was Enzo Amore who you can blame for the fans not giving a shit about your match. Towards the end of this thing, Sheamus is yelling out for a bro kick. We got Drake Maverick getting on the apron for an interference. Cesaro knocks Rezar, and Sheamus follows up with a bro kick, but Rezar kicks out as Drake Maverick puts Rezar's foot on the bottom rope to break it up. Referee sees it, and he stops the count. Now, it looked like to me anyway, before Drake Maverick actually put Rezar's boot on the bottom rope, it looked like that he had his arm underneath the bottom rope anyway, which would have caused the referee to stop the count regardless. But the referee stops it anyway because of Drake Maverick putting Razor's boot on the bottom rope. Cesaro chases Drake around the ring. Drake runs into the Big Show. It's as if he ran, ran into a fucking tree. So Big Show was standing there, knocks Drake Maverick to the floor, falls down like a sack of fucking tomatoes. Drake gets back up, runs to the apron, and Show grabs Drake Maverick by the throat as he's standing on the floor. And Drake Maverick is on the apron. So we get a close-up of what's going on here. Like, I, I, I'm, I, I'm like wondering what the fuck is going on. Show has got him just strangled there on the apron. And then all of a sudden we see this liquid coming from Drake Maverick's pants. The guy fucking pissed himself. And Cesaro and Sheamus come over. They're staring at his crotch. Big Show walks away laughing. Everyone is laughing here at the expense of Drake Maverick pissing his fucking pants. The Authors of Pain take advantage of this distraction, hit a big double-team powerbomb on Sheamus, Razor makes the pin, and the Authors of Pain beat the bar at the Survivor Series. This was the absolute maximum level of cringe, with WWE forcing the commentary team to recite Piss poor jokes. See what I did there? The commentary team recited piss poor jokes, showing exactly their level of creativity. I mean, this is absolutely fucking ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Especially for a team like the Authors of Pain. You couldn't book this shit in your worst nightmares. It sucks that it has to come at the expense of Drake Maverick, who I thought was going to be taken as a serious fucking manager for two guys in Akam and Razar who should be taken seriously as a tag team. Meanwhile, you got Drake Maverick helping them win the match, causing a distraction because he pissed his fucking pants because he was being strangled by the big show. Are you fucking kidding me? You would never, never see this shit with the AOP in NXT. Never. So if it's not done in NXT should not be done on the main roster. This was garbage. This was easily the worst match of the fucking show. And you can thank Enzo Amore for half that. Because the fans were more interested in we want Enzo than we want the bar or we want AOP. Sucks to be AOP tonight and the bar at Survivor Series. Buddy Murphy versus Mustafa Ali. Can I just say that I'm glad that this match actually appeared on the main show. I was dreading that the WWE made a last-minute decision to put this match on the pre-show, but thank God they didn't. And I know that if you guys are watching 205 Live, you're seeing this type of shit every fucking week. You see matches like this every single week on 205 Live. So this is nothing new. If you guys have watched these guys, you know what to expect. So for those people who don't know Buddy Murphy or Mustafa Ali, this is exactly the type of shit that you're going to get on 205 Live, but on 205 Live, you're going to get a longer match. You're going to get a more competitive match on 205 Live. These guys were given X amount of time, and they maximized the time that they were given tonight at the Survivor Series, 
And I hope, I hope that the Staples Center crowd did them justice. I hope WWE listened to the reaction that they got. I hope the WWE listened to the chance of This Is Awesome. I hope the WWE listened to the chance of 205 Live. I hope that WWE doesn't put these guys on the pre-show ever again. Every time there's a main roster pay-per-view and you want to put a Cruiserweight Championship match on said show, that match needs to be on the main on the main show. Simple. That's the only way you're going to help build brand awareness for 205 Live. If you're watching the pre-show, as far as I'm concerned, you're not part of the main show. I'm glad that these guys were a part of the main show. Mustafa Ali is 205's live, uh, 205 Live's version of Seth Rollins. He actually came out dressed as Seth Rollins, almost identical to what Seth Rollins would usually wear. Buddy Murphy, he is one of those guys that was an untapped potential in WWE. The guy wanted to be on 205 Live. He wanted Triple H to give him an opportunity on 205 Live. And look at the fucking caliber of athlete that Buddy Murphy has become. So much so that you got guys like Kenny Omega wanting to test the likes of Buddy Murphy in a WWE ring. And he mentioned that on Twitter. That's how great Buddy Murphy has become, man. The guy is an absolute fucking beast at what he does. Buddy Murphy overpowered early Mustafa Ali. Ali tried to fight off Murphy. Connects with some stiff shots, some stiff elbows. After some back and forth, Ali climbs up to the top rope. And in one of the oh my god moments of the night, Murphy shoved Ali off the top rope. He went flying backwards into the barricade, neck first. That was an oh my god. If this was WW2K19, that would be an oh my god moment. Unreal. So Ali was definitely at that point taken out of the match. Murphy capitalized on that. A few minutes of offense. Ali tried to come back. Kicks Murphy in the face. Goes for a springboard. Murphy uh, catches him and hurls him. Another oh my god moment. He catches Buddy Murphy off a springboard and launches him over the top rope. Hits the ground. Murphy then lining up for a suicide dive. He's got one of the prettiest suicide dives that you will ever see, man. The air and the distance that Buddy Murphy gets when he flies over the top rope. Fucking unreal. He launched himself over the top rope with a senton, almost clearing the entire ringside area and hit the steel bar- uh, hit the steel ramp in the aisleway. Fucking beautiful. They bring it back in the ring. Ali turns it around. Ali with some super kicks. A spike hurricane rana that I swear to God, man, makes you cringe every time it's done. Holy shit. I would be absolutely terrified if I'm Buddy Murphy to take that spot, man. He, he, he's either fucking crazy or the best seller in the entire WWE. Spike Rana that made me fucking grimace. Another close pin attempt there by Ali. Murphy kicks out. Ali with a big kick to the jaw. Ali gets more offense. Drags Murphy over in the corner. Goes for his finishing move, the 054. Murphy jumps up and sends Ali to the floor, hitting hard, face first on the apron, on the way down. Murphy then goes to the floor and grabs Ali, changes his mind, and decides to take apart the announce table. So Murphy takes Ali to the table. Ali kicks him in the head. Ali then runs back up after gaining some momentum. He runs up on the table in one fluid motion, Grabs Murphy and delivers a fluid motion Spanish fly off the announce table to the floor on the outside. People chanting, holy shit. People chanting 205. Unbelievable stuff. And this is the type of shit that you usually see from Mustafa Ali and Buddy Murphy on 205 Live. Ali brings it back in the ring. Looks to go for the 054 again. Murphy stops him. Nails a super kick to Ali through his legs right to the face. Murphy ends up hitting a power bomb followed by a sit out power bomb for a two count only. Ali kicks out. Murphy goes for Murphy's law. Ali counters. They collide in the corner and Ali attempts to get the upper hand, jumps off the second turnbuckle and Ali gets caught with a devastating jumping knee right to the side of the face, knocked him out cold. Murphy then grabs Ali for the Murphy's law and pins him to retain the Cruiserweight Championship. Great fucking match. They maximized the amount of time that they were given. This is a step in the right direction. They were put on the main roster. Nobody changed the match from the main roster to the pre-show. And the only thing that I could say 
or criticize about this match is that they were that they were given such a short amount of time. But the amount of time that they were given, they maximized every fucking second of it. I could have watched those guys go for another 10 minutes for this Cruiserweight Championship, man. But it's baby steps. It's steps in the right direction. If you guys aren't watching 205 Live, you got to be watching 205, 205 Live with guys like Buddy Murphy and Mustafa Ali. And hopefully, this is an exclamation point. This is two pay-per-views in a row now. We had the Super Showdown, in which WWE had Buddy Murphy win the Cruiserweight Championship in front of his hometown. And now here at the Survivor Series, when we didn't think it was going to be on the main show, they were put on the main show at a decent fucking spot on the card. So hopefully this is WWE's way of saying, from this point on, we're going to start featuring the Cruiserweights with the rest of the roster on the main shows for these major pay-per-views. I hope so. These guys certainly deserve it. The caliber of talent that Buddy Murphy and Mustafa Ali are are leading 205 Live, and these are some of the best athletes in the entire company. There's no way you should keep these guys in their own bubble and not feature them in front of a packed house with 17,000 people at a major pay-per-view. That's fucking ridiculous. That's a bad business move. So hopefully WWE listens to this audience, and hopefully WWE starts to feature 205 Live talent and the Cruiserweight Championship more on these main shows in a prime spot, because that is definitely going to bring people to come to understand that, listen, these guys are great, I want to see more of these guys, and it's going to bring people to become aware of what 205 Live is doing. To me, that's only a good thing. Moving on here, man, the Men's Survivor Series match. At this point, Monday Night Raw, there was no way that Monday Night Raw was going to lose this overall Raw versus SmackDown theme because there was only two matches left to go. There's no way Ronda Rousey in Charlotte is going to result in Ronda Rousey losing, and there's no way that Daniel Bryan is going to win his match against Brock Lesnar. So at this point, Monday Night Raw had won the Survivor Series for another year, and I don't really understand that. But the Men's Survivor Series match was off and running, and there was a brief fight between the two teams before the bell rang. Things quickly calm back down. So you had The Miz, Shane McMahon, Rey Mysterio, Samoa Joe, and Jeff Hardy. They went against Braun Strowman, Drew McIntyre, Finn Balor, Bobby Trashley, and Dolph Ziggler. So that that was the match for Raw vs. SmackDown. So the two teams were going at it before the bell rang. Strowman and McIntyre began to argue about who was going to start first. Now, This was a common theme throughout this entire match. Braun Strowman wanted to take the lead here, and he wanted to, I guess, stake claim to Monday Night Raw winning this match. Drew McIntyre, he came off as a dominant force in this match, and he had a very boss-like mentality. So you had two clashing personalities here in Braun Strowman and Drew McIntyre who pretty much came off as the leader of this team. And they clashed in doing so. So, Strowman starts yelling at Drew McIntyre to get his ass out of the ring. So, Samoa Joe, being that Samoa Joe is all, is, is all you know, no nonsense, no bullshit with Samoa Joe. He's going to take advantage of you at the drop of a fucking hat. Samoa Joe took advantage of this miscue here between Strowman and McIntyre. And he locked in the coquina clutch on Drew McIntyre. McIntyre tried to fight off by running up the turnbuckle to reverse it. And Joe, slow to get up, he turned around and immediately he ate a Claymore kick. And Samoa Joe was eliminated in less than a minute to chance of this is bullshit. At this point, all I could do is laugh. Samoa Joe was eliminated in less than a minute and we didn't see him have any interaction with Drew McIntyre for the most part outside of a fucking Claymore kick and a coquina clutch. We didn't see him have any interaction with Braun Strowman. We didn't have any interaction between him and Bobby Lashley or Trashley. I will never refer to him by his normal name, Bobby Trashley. Samoa Joe was eliminated in one minute to chance of this is bullshit. Now, I am giving the WWE the benefit of the doubt here. I don't understand why this couldn't be Jeff Hardy. I don't understand why this couldn't be anybody else in this situation. Samoa Joe had to be the one to be eliminated in one fucking minute. Why? The guy is either hurt, bad, 
And WWE is utilizing him now for whatever reason. If Joe is hurt, why the fuck is he on the team to begin with? If Joe is hurt, why isn't Almas in that spot? So you're already running a SmackDown Live team with with five guys, realistically, four. Five, just by Joe's body being there, but if he's no good to anybody, why the fuck is he in the match? Why are you sacrificing this guy, no matter if it was to Drew McIntyre or not? Nobody wants to see Samoa Joe get eliminated in one fucking minute. Now, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people kind of brushed it off for the most part because it was Drew McIntyre, but still, seeing Samoa Joe eliminated in a minute doesn't do anybody any good. So hopefully the guy is fucking hurt and WWE is not this fucking stupid in their booking and creative with Samoa Joe because that was fucking ridiculous. So I'm hoping that that decision was because of Joe being hurt. I didn't like that at all. Hopefully news comes out on that this week. Shane and Ziggler get in the ring. A rematch of sorts from the Crown Jewel pay-per-view. Ziggler hits a beautiful standing dropkick and a zigzag on Shane. Miz breaks that up. Miz then drags Shane to his corner and Miz tags in. Strowman tags in and Drew McIntyre then quickly tags himself in, causing a huge argument with Team Raw and all chaos breaks down. All remaining members at this point are fighting. Rey Mysterio trips up Strowman, delivers the 619. Ombre on Strowman. Shane and Miz take out Strowman to the outside. Team SmackDown clear off the American announce table and place Strowman on top of it. Shane does his signature elbow off the top rope through the announce table, through Strowman, and it's all chaos at this point. This is the moment, briefly, where the tide turned in favor of SmackDown Live. So we get back in the ring. Miz is controlling Drew McIntyre. Drew levels Miz with a huge glass cow kiss, uh, that big headbutt. Drew McIntyre has the chance to tag. He has the chance to tag out, and he doesn't tag out. This is why I stated that Drew McIntyre had a very boss-like mentality. He wanted to take control over the entire fucking match, staking claim to dominance on Monday Night Raw. So he doesn't tag out. So Miz comes from behind, and Drew drops him. Balor then tags himself in on Drew McIntyre, slaps Drew on the arm to tag himself in, and then drops Drew with a kick to the face from the apron. Brief back and forth with Balor and Ray. These guys were great together in the ring. Balor by himself looked completely like a different person tonight. I don't know what it was. I don't know if he got caught up in the moment or he was fucking excited, but Balor looked like a house on fire tonight. And his little back and forth with Ray is something that I would love to see more of. That is the type of feud that could really carry a fucking U.S. title or an intercontinental title on a certain brand. So that would be a great feud if WWE wanted to visit that somewhere down the line. Finn Balor, like I said, in general looked great. He almost looked like he had some refreshed sense of energy about him. He was eventually eliminated by Rey Mysterio with the 619, and that made the score 4-4. to So it's tied up Raw versus SmackDown here. McIntyre was incredibly pissed at Finn Balor. He threw him out of the ring, so you know that their issues are going to continue on Monday Night Raw tomorrow night and probably into TLC. Shane McMahon pinned Dolph Ziggler. I don't understand why. I don't understand who made this decision. Shane McIntyre pinned Dolph Ziggler again after a coast-to-coast. I don't know who benefits from this. I don't know how this benefits Dolph Ziggler in any fucking way. Ziggler did the deed for whatever creative decision was made in Saudi Arabia. And now we are here again in Los Angeles at the Survivor Series and Dolph Ziggler is laying down for Shane McMahon again? How does this benefit anybody if Raw beat SmackDown 6 to nothing? After the Survivor Series was over. Did Dolph Ziggler really need to be pinned by Shane McMahon again? How does this benefit Shane McMahon? When his brand was shut out at the Survivor Series. This shit pissed me off. This would have been a perfect way for Ziggler to extract some sort of revenge 
after Crown Jewel, but in typical WWE fashion, Ziggler continues to be treated like fucking shit. SmackDown's up 4-3. I don't understand it. And they're on different brands, and this will not be talked about again. So, in the last month, or the last three weeks, Ziggler is 0-2 against Shane McMahon. Let that sink in. Miz worked over Bobby Trashley, tagged in Shane again, wanting Shane to do yet another coast-to-coast on Trashley. He was laying in the corner. So he jumped off the top rope. He was going to do a coast. He did a coast to coast already to Dolph Ziggler. Pinned him. So at this point, Shane McMahon was completely exasperated. He was done. So Miz wants Shane McMahon to jump off the top rope again to do another coast to coast. After sleeping for about 10, 12 minutes on the outside after the elbow drop by Shane McMahon, Shane McMahon got all the big spots in this match. Two coast-to-coasts, a big elbow drop through the table on Braun Strowman. Their priorities building up Shane McMahon for what? Meanwhile, look at all the talent you got in this ring. Shane McMahon's the one guy that gets the most highlights in this match. It's fucking ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. So it does another coast-to-coast on Trashley, and after sleeping for about 12 minutes on the outside, you didn't think I noticed that, huh? All the, all the time, these matches, WWE books them in the same way, these multi-man matches, whether it's a Survivor Series match, a triple threat, a ladder match, a Money in the Bank, whatever. There's just so much sleeping on the outside. It's just abnormal. It, it doesn't play into the overall realism of the match. Miz was sleeping, Shane was sleeping, Strowman was sleeping. Fucking, it's, it's just so cheesy. It's so cheesy looking. And it's something that a lot of people, not only me, complain about. So he does another coast-to-coast on Trashley, but this time, Strowman, after sleeping, jumped onto the apron and swats Shane out of midair, mid-flight in the coast-to-coast, levels him with a fucking clothesline, completely just devastating him. Trashley crawls over to cover Shane after that brutal spot until Mysterio makes the save to break it up. Strowman eventually turned the entire match around. One man single-handedly turned this entire match around. I guess the nap did him good. Strowman turned the entire match around, eliminating Jeff Hardy after he blocked a twist of fate. I don't know what the fuck drugs Jeff Hardy was on, where he attempted a twist of fate on fucking Braun Strowman. He got nailed with a power slam. He was eliminated. Rey Mysterio was eliminated after trying the 619 again. The first time was successful. The second time, not so much. He turned that into a power slam. Miz was eliminated after a short chase on the outside, which I'll talk about in a second. Strowman power slammed him in the ring, leaving 3-1 to one Raw over SmackDown. So we had Trashley, McIntyre, and Strowman against Shane McMahon. Now, there was a report about Braun Strowman's knees being an issue that he was working with two blown-out knees. Strowman looked pretty fucking impressive tonight. Strowman looked like the old Strowman. He was moving around. He was running at almost a full speed like I remember him running when he was healthy. So I'm not sure if that report is credible at all right now, but Strowman looked very impressive tonight. That doesn't mean I want to see him in the Universal Championship title picture. It just means that he looked impressive tonight where I hope that his health is thumbs up. That's all I want to say about that. So Shane McMahon realizes that he's left three-on-one against three of the biggest guys on Monday Night Raw. He realized this, and he stood face-to-face in his corner. He was in his corner, backed against the turnbuckle, and Strowman was there in his corner. Shane realized this. He's, like, wiping the sweat off his head, and he's like, fuck it. Give me what you got. He, He pretty much admitted defeat at that point. He says, bring it. Crowd is chanting, you can do it to Shane McMahon. No, you can't. Because out of the corner, Strowman launched himself at Shane McMahon, delivering a missile drop kick. I think Shane McMahon's half, his upper half went into the fucking fourth row with this missile, missile drop kick. After that, a power slam eliminated Shane McMahon, and Braun Strowman wins the match single handedly for his team and Monday Night Raw. After the match, Baron Corbin attacked. Braun Strowman like a coward and ran away quickly and he stood on the apron with Leo Rush, Bobby Trashley, and Drew McIntyre and I guess we're getting Strowman versus Corbin at TLC. Stephanie McMahon laid out, you 
You can do whatever you want to Braun Strowman after Survivor Series. He just won Team Raw against SmackDown. So there you go. Off to the races. You can do whatever you want with Braun Strowman now. So we're going to figure out what's going to happen there leading to TLC. Probably some sort of gimmick match at TLC. I'm not interested in it. And I'm not interested in Braun Strowman chasing the Universal Championship. I'm not. So we'll see what happens with that. But uh, this was an entertaining match for the most part. And that was it. I just didn't like the fact that Samoa Joe was eliminated in a minute and the fact that Shane McMahon got all the big highlights in this match. Other than that, it was a pretty generic, standard Survivor Series elimination match. Charlotte Flair versus Ronda Rousey. We got two matches left on this show, and you know for a fact that SmackDown is not winning either one of them. So this was a great, one-two combination to close Survivor Series. I mentioned that off the script that Charlotte Flair is really going to be tested in this match with Ronda Rousey. So is Ronda Rousey. Ronda Rousey is going to be tested as well. This was going to be Ronda's biggest test to date against Charlotte Flair. She's wrestled a lot of non-wrestlers. She's wrestled Nia Jax, even though it was a decent match just based on Nia's size, and it was Ronda's first singles match, and we were very surprised by what happened there. Um, I'm not expecting a similar outcome in the second match. Ronda's wrestled Alexa Bliss. Very piss poor match. Ronda's wrestled wrestled Nikki Bella. Ronda's wrestled Alicia Fox. You know, a a lot of throwaway matches. A lot of wrestlers that I don't really consider wrestlers. They're, they're, They're more so divas. This was Ronda's first test. I mentioned that off the script with Charlotte Flair. This was going to be a bigger test for Charlotte because everybody says that Charlotte is the best in the world. She's the queen. She's the best female wrestler on the planet. And I tend to think people overrate Charlotte very often. So if Charlotte could bring Ronda Rousey to a match that I expect her to, I would not be as hard on Charlotte going on into the future. What Charlotte did tonight was not only shut me up, but she brought Ronda Rousey to the best match that she's had since April and her tag team match with Triple H and Stephanie McMahon. This match was booked beautifully. I loved everything about this match. Charlotte has this, uh, I guess, reborn attitude ever since coming out of Evolution. She put on one of the best women's matches that I think I've ever seen with Becky Lynch at Evolution, and that continued here tonight at Survivor Series with Ronda Rousey. Not only did Charlotte bring Ronda Rousey to her best match in WWE to date, Charlotte actually looked fucking evil. She looked legit, and I honestly seen, for the first time in a very long time, I seen her father almost come out of her body tonight, and what she did attitude-wise and just her snapping on Ronda Rousey. Charlotte did fucking fantastic tonight. She brought Ronda Rousey to a legit WWE match at Survivor Series. I was pleased with literally everything in this match. The little blood that Ronda Rousey started spitting up made this match all that much better. Ronda Rousey had a nice elbow delivered to her from Charlotte Flair while they were in a submission hold on the mat. I don't know if it was a busted lip or if it was a knocked tooth, but Ronda Rousey started spitting blood, and that visual alone added to a lot just based off everything that we've seen with Becky Lynch so far. So I love the addition of the... uh, It wasn't planned. It didn't look like it was planned. It looked like it was completely accidental, and it just happened. But the addition of some color in this match really added a lot after everything that we've seen with Becky Lynch this week. So, she started bleeding, and Flair starts telling Rousey to shut up. There was just something about Charlotte tonight that was just so animalistic and so aggressive, and I fucking loved it, you know? Usually we see Charlotte crying, and she's all emotional. Charlotte being evil bitch Charlotte tonight against Ronda Rousey, almost living up to the story that she's fighting for Becky Lynch, really, really just... It made me sit there almost eye-opened. I, I, I was, it was beautiful, a beautiful thing to see. Tells Rowdy, Rousey to shut up. She continues to control the match. Rousey finally breaks free, drops, uh, breaks free, tries to flee by dropping Flair with some strikes. Rousey with a knee, 
Rousey then with an arm bar on the ropes. She did that arm bar over the top rope, and she tried to, uh, I guess, damage Charlotte's arm. Hold is broken. Referee breaks it with the five count. Rousey goes to the top. Flair knocks her down. Flair comes up, but Rousey slams her to the mat face first from the top. Rousey then rolls from the top rope into another arm bar on Charlotte. They roll around back and forth. Flair turns it into a Boston Crab. Ronda desperately trying to reach for the ropes. Flair pulls her back. Flair goes for the figure four. Ronda blocks it. Flair kicks Ronda in the face, hits a natural selection. Rousey shrugs it off, goes for another arm bar. Rousey then drags Flair, working on her arm that she worked on earlier in the match. Flair then hits a backbreaker and a kick to send Rousey back down. So we got some back and forth. We got some counters between the two. It's a very, very physical match. It was very hard hitting. You see the fucking perspiration and the fatigue mounting on both women. Rousey starts getting all fired up. This is the Rousey I want to see, man. The animalistic Ronda Rousey. This is when she performs at her best. Got blood fucking dripping down. The side of Ronda Rousey being fucking just mean bitch Ronda with blood dripping down her mouth. It was a great fucking sight. Rousey gets fired up, but she turns around And when I mean this was Charlotte's best spear, she speared Ronda in half. Flair covers for a close two count, man. I literally jumped off my couch. That was a close near fall, a believable near fall in which I thought Charlotte had the match won after that. Rousey pulls Flair into another submission, but Flair tries to apply the figure for submission. Rousey rolls out of the ring and they both hit the floor. Rousey uses the barrier and brings Flair back in. Rousey manhandles Flair, yelling out um, to the crowd, this is my town, LA's my home. Mixed reaction. Ronda was being booed in her hometown. Rousey then strikes Flair in the corner. Flair starts firing back, and she delivered against Ronda. You know, Ronda was very stiff, and Charlotte was stiff right back to Ronda. Man, she came out of the corner exploding with knife-edge chops, devastating chops. Flair kicks Ronda's leg out. So we got more back and forth. Flair levels Rousey with a huge big boot. Fans chanting, this is awesome. Great fucking match up until this point. Rousey counters and drops into another armbar, and Flair makes it to the rope. Rousey then drags Flair back over. Puts Flair on her shoulders. She gets this kind of half-assed, uh, I guess, like, I don't know if it was like, oh, it was like a, a one of them fall-away slams that she does. It was very half-assed. Ronda did not connect at all with the fall-away slam. It, it looked like fatigue at this point was really mounting on Ronda Rousey. So she does that fall-away slam. She calls it the Piper's Pit, I believe. So Rousey goes to put Flair away. She hangs on. Flair makes it back to the bottom rope. Referee breaks it up. Flair clutches her arm. Rousey starts yelling at her to get back in the ring and finish things. So the referee starts counting. So Flair is just wasting time on the outside. So Flair comes back in around 8, 9. She goes right back in and then rolls right back out. So Ronda runs around the ring. And all of a sudden, Ronda is chasing Flair on the outside. And Ronda is met with a kendo stick. Flair gets herself intentionally disqualified and absolutely goes batshit crazy on Ronda Rousey with a kendo stick. So much so that the welts from the kendo stick were appearing all over Ronda's arm, on her back. She had blood on her chest dripping from her mouth. She, it looked like she had a bruise on her face. Charlotte was absolutely going crazy on Ronda Rousey. Referees come in, they try to break it up. Charlotte shoving referees down. She takes a moment of respite. She's like, okay, okay, okay. She comes back in with a steel chair. She puts the steel chair around Ronda's chest and stomps on the steel chair, caving Ronda Rousey's chest in. And at this point, we got every fucking official in the back coming on down. And Charlotte is there. It's like she was possessed. It's like some sort of fucking demonic possession overcame Charlotte. Tonight in Los Angeles. So the crowd was chanting, thank you, Charlotte. And I don't understand this reaction. This is where things were becoming a lot more interesting. Thank you, Charlotte chants ringing out through the Staples Center. 
So the crowd was chanting for Charlotte, the, the camera, and the entire scene that happened stayed in the ring with, with Ronda Rousey. At one point, Ronda looked so disappointed, she was about to drop the women's championship, or at least I thought she was about to drop the women's championship, almost in a way as if, I don't deserve this after what I did tonight. So, Ronda looked completely defeated. She was telling all the officials to get away, don't touch me, I'm going to walk to the back on my own. The crowd was booing Ronda Rousey. She looked, as she got to the top of the ramp, she looked out over the Staples Center, and it was almost as if Ronda was fucking disgusted with what she was hearing. And I don't really know what happened here. Now, the only thing I could surmise from this entire situation was this match was made last minute and they didn't have enough time to plan and, I guess, step-by-step plan out a match for the Survivor Series five days in advance. So it looked like, to me, whatever we seen tonight was the same exact match that we were going to get with Becky Lynch and Ronda Rousey tonight but when Becky went down with injury, they had, no, they had no choice but to put Charlotte in that situation and give us the same match that Becky would have given us. Because when Charlotte got herself disqualified, I all I did was envision Becky Lynch being in that same position with that kendo stick and getting the same result that Charlotte got tonight. That's the only thing I can think of. Now, none of this made sense to me. They were trying to build sympathy... For Charlotte Flair tonight, uh, for Ronda Rousey tonight, they tried to build sympathy for Ronda Rousey, but in the end, Ronda was getting booed. And I don't really understand that, that, that twist to the story. I don't think WWE really anticipated that. Now, Ronda didn't deserve that. After what Charlotte did tonight, Charlotte actually gave us a very heel-like Charlotte. We were supposed to be sympathetic toward Ronda Rousey, but the crowd said no. The crowd didn't want Ronda tonight. They wanted Charlotte. And the only reason why they cheered Charlotte was because of Becky Lynch. This is where Becky's popularity and this is where the white-hot Becky Lynch that we got right now is literally changing the entire landscape of whatever WWE is trying to tell. WWE wanted to tell a certain story with Becky Lynch and Becky Lynch's overwhelming popularity completely changed everything that WWE had planned. And now here we are with Charlotte and Ronda Rousey where Charlotte is the natural baby face in this entire thing. Ronda Rousey's beloved by everybody. And Becky Lynch's popularity is so much so that it got Ronda Rousey booed and Becky Lynch wasn't even there tonight because the fans knew that Charlotte was fighting for Becky. Now the only natural progression out of all of this is Ronda Rousey turning heel. I would love to see it. In fact, I actually tweeted out on social media tonight while everything was happening. While all this was happening, this would have been an absolutely brilliant debut for Shayna Baszler. With Charlotte going animalistic balls to the wall on Ronda Rousey tonight with the attack that she did with the kendo stick and the steel chair and beating up the referees, this would have been a perfect opportunity for Shayna Baszler to come in and save Ronda Rousey. Now, the only reason why I think they they didn't do that or they wouldn't even dare doing that was it might have got Charlotte booed. Now, I, I would have done it that way. I would have had Shayna Baszler debut tonight. It would have been fantastic. But from what I see after what transpired tonight, it looks like the MMA horsewomen may go into this feud with the WWE horsewomen as heels. Because there's no way... There's absolutely no way that wherever Becky Lynch is, she's going to get booed. So by association alone, Charlotte, Sasha, and Bayley are going to be on the babyface side. WWE may have no choice but to present Ronda, Shayna, Jessamine, and Marina as heels. That's the only natural progression of things right now. Will WWE pull the trigger on a Ronda Rousey heel turn? I highly doubt it. I highly, highly doubt it. WWE, I don't think would put Ronda in that situation where she is the focal point of a women's evolution and your Raw Women's Champion doing PR and she's going to be in the spotlight and she's going to be doing dastardly heel-like things. So WWE may actually take a page out of what happened with Becky and Charlotte and they may have the fans just go into this cheering for who they want. But in the end, 
now that Becky is as white hot as anybody in the entire company, and now Charlotte channeled her inner Becky, this is only going to make for a great fucking storyline, man. We are on the verge. I'm telling you right now, if WWE books this the way it should be, this will go down as not only a true evolution, and I already hear people fucking staking claim to all WWE is 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 ruining the revolution. They're giving it all to the horsewomen and Ronda and Charlotte and all this other shit. They're leaving everybody out. This is the opportunity for WWE to tell great story. They 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 don't usually do this on the main roster. They have a gold mine waiting with this storyline. If WWE plays their cards right, this will be the greatest women's storyline, the greatest women's angle in the history of this company. And it all is being, uh, it's all being fucking spearheaded by Becky Lynch. The only reason why Becky Lynch is as hot as she is, is because the WWE forced something on the fans and they just relentlessly said no. And now tonight, with Becky not being there and the fans not getting Ronda versus Becky, WWE substituted Charlotte for Becky. The only reason why WWE sat there tonight wondering why Ronda Rousey got booed is because Becky Lynch. Becky Lynch. That's how fucking, that's how, I, I, want, I want, epic. That's how epic it is. That's how influential Becky Lynch has been with this run that she's on right now. So much so that she's getting Ronda Rousey booed without even being there in the building. You know, a lot of people are wondering, is Ronda Rousey ready for the main event? A lot of people are wondering, is Becky Lynch versus Ronda Rousey something that's going to live up to a main event for WrestleMania if WWE goes ahead with the plan to do that at WrestleMania in New Jersey? After tonight, my simple answer is without any hesitation, yes. Ronda is money. Ronda is getting better and better every single time. There are aspects to her act that I do not like. I honestly think some of the promo work that she's shown off in the last couple of weeks are a little forced and a little unnatural. Someone in that position doesn't talk the way that she does, using the verbiage and the vocabulary that she does. So it sounds a little forced and a little unnatural. But for Ronda and, and the, the showcase that she had tonight with Charlotte, not only is Ronda ready for a main event with Becky Lynch, but Jesus Christ, this four horsewomen feud that is coming is absolutely going to be fucking epic. And if WWE and the women involved in this storyline can maintain this level of fucking just ferocity, we're, we are certainly in for something special. Believe me, this is going to be special if all these women maintain this level of ferocity and, and just realism. The one thing that stood out tonight was how fucking real Charlotte looked against Ronda Rousey. And that is one aspect of this that needs to be enhanced and built upon moving forward. I thought this was fantastic. Main event. Main event. Something that I've been looking forward to for a very long time. For about four years now. Brock Lesnar versus Daniel Bryan. Universal Champion versus WWE Champion. The one thing that we were all wondering was, why Daniel, why? Coming out of SmackDown Live. We didn't get any answer. We even had Daniel Bryan interviewed before this match took place, and he remained silent. All we seen from Daniel Bryan was a smirk, a smile, and he honestly looked like he was fucking losing his mind. Daniel Bryan comes out with his theme music playing. He starts to do the yes chant, and then after a few yes movements... He stopped. He stopped. He wasn't giving the fans nothing of a yes chant. He walked down the aisle. He looked like the American Dragon Reborn. Crawling his way to the ring on the on the on the steel ramp. He looked like he was fucking ready to fight. And he had this smug look on his face as if he was pretty much saying without actually saying it, I'm the fucking WWE champion. I'm the man and I'm the greatest of all time. Brock Lesnar makes his way down to the ring. Paul Heyman introduces Brock Lesnar. It is what it is. This match begins. Now, the one thing that a lot of people wondered about is how are they going to book a heel Daniel Bryan, who definitely is a heel, against a champion in Brock Lesnar that, honestly, nobody really respects. 
Nobody respects Brock Lesnar. It's the same old shit with Brock Lesnar. In fact, he got chance of boring, same old shit. It's the same garbage with Brock Lesnar every single time. But the one thing with Brock Lesnar that always was there was that when he wants to work, that motherfucker will work. Now, after this match got started, I was excited, and Daniel Bryan was trying to take out Brock's leg, and he started to pretty much go to the outside and try to, uh, I, I guess, goat Brock Lesnar into chasing him. He was being very hesitant. He was playing mind games with Brock Lesnar. And, and you've seen the frustration and the anger mounting on Brock Lesnar to a point when, when he got his hands on Daniel Bryan for the first time, shit was about to fucking explode. So at that point, when Bryan and Lesnar started to get back in the ring and Lesnar got his hands on, on Daniel Bryan for the first time and started throwing him around, I was legit scared. I was legit scared for Brock Lesnar uh, and Daniel Bryan. Uh, more so Daniel Bryan, obviously. He was throwing Daniel Bryan around. That one, that first German suplex was the only one that I was questionable about. For, for, for the most part, I actually went back and, and did some watching uh, of the match before I actually recorded this. I just quickly went back and I watched some of those early German suplexes. It, it looked like Brock Lesnar was... More safe than he usually was. Especially after Monday Night Raw when he fucking obliterated the Singh brothers. That first German suplex was a little questionable. Daniel Bryan looked like that was the roughest bump of the night. But Brock Lesnar, for the most part, dominated early on in this match. And I was wondering what the fuck was going on. Believe me, it ran through my head that if this is the match that we're getting, and Bryan is going to amount to zero offense... Obviously, I was thinking what everybody else was thinking, that this was a way for WWE to punish Daniel Bryan for not going to Saudi Arabia and participating in Crown Jewel. But then, I, I want to think better of WWE. They gave him a heel turn. Vince okayed the heel turn. They gave him the WWE Championship, and they gave him the main event of Survivor Series with Brock Lesnar. So how much of a punishment is it really? But from the looks of the match, the way it was booked early on, it looked like a fucking punishment. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I'm watching this and I'm looking at Brian trying to mount the comeback. And all of a sudden, he manages to kick Brock Lesnar in the face. Second kick to the neck brings Lesnar down. Okay? All of a sudden, he just comes, he comes out with some kicks. Lesnar ends up sending Brian into the referee with an F5. So Brian's trying to mount a comeback here. Lesnar picks Brian up with an F5 and inadvertently knocks the referee down. Brian then does the same thing he did to AJ Styles to win the WWE Championship on SmackDown Live. He delivered an emphatic low blow to Brock Lesnar and then hit that huge running knee and I swear to fucking Christ, I swear on my grandfather's fucking tomb, I jumped off my couch with the near fall and I honestly thought that Daniel Bryan was going to win the match in that moment. Man, I almost broke my living room fucking table. I jumped off my couch, man. That was one of the best near falls of the entire year for 2018, man. Hits that flying knee and Heyman screamed out at the near fall that was. Bryan hits several yes kicks, keeping Lesnar down. Brian then unloads with kicks to Brock Lesnar. Fans are actually cheering. Now, how stupid does it look that WWE built Daniel Bryan up as a heel coming into this match five days before the Survivor Series against a heel Brock Lesnar trying to come back in a babyface role? Can you imagine the fucking match that would have been if Brian was a babyface built up the proper way going into this shit after what we've seen tonight? So it was a little half-assed with the heel turn that was Daniel Bryan on Tuesday night, and we get this type of match that we got at Survivor Series. So that was the one thing that really ran through my mind during all of this. This is all great. No matter if Daniel Bryan's heel or babyface, even what happened on Tuesday night, people bought into everything that Daniel Bryan was doing, and there's not one person in that arena that didn't want Daniel Bryan to win this match. So, Bryan is mounting some comeback against Brock Lesnar at this point. Runs in with another knee attempt, but Lesnar catches him in midair. Brian slides out, sends Lesnar out of the ring. So, Brian launches himself over the top to the floor, but Lesnar catches him. And Brian slides out, pushes Lesnar face first into the ring post. 
Brian runs and jumps from the apron, dropping Lesnar with a big knee off the apron. Brian runs the ropes for a suicide dive, but Lesnar catches him and drives him into the ring post. And Lesnar lifts Brian up again, ramps him spine first into the post. So he got two back shots right on the steel post. Lesnar then grabs half of the steel ring steps and tries to ram them at Brian, but he moves, but he meets all steel posts instead. So the steel steps came crashing down on top of Brock Lesnar. Brian goes back to the apron, hits a flying knee to bring Lesnar back down to the floor. Referee starts counting, and Lesnar counters a kick with one of his own. Lesnar brings Brian back in the ring, makes it back in before the 10 count, so they're now both back in the ring. Lesnar gets up, Brian hits the running knee, another near fall for a two count. So both guys slow to get back up. Brian takes the knee out from Brock Lesnar behind with a chop block. Brian drags Lesnar, slams his leg into the ring post, and Lesnar falls to the floor. So I'm loving the amount of offense that Brian is getting in this match. Brian brings it back in the ring, goes up top, hits a missile drop kick from the top rope. Brian starts getting hyped. Heyman on the outside about to lose his fucking mind. Brian charges with another knee, sends Lesnar into the corner. Brian with another corner drop kick. Brian then charges at Lesnar again. Goes for F5, catches him with another F5. Brian counters and drops him from the F5 position into a yes lock. Fans are going fucking crazy. Lesnar's face turning tomato red. He's selling the effects of the yes lock. Absolutely brilliant. And then Lesnar fights out. Brian's got the yes lock hooked in. He takes Brian's hands apart. Breaks out of the yes lock. And at that point, Brian applies the yes lock again. He tries to he tries to kick his head in, or I think Brian was like elbowing uh, Lesnar to try and get the yes lock applied. Lesnar tries to move towards the ropes. Brian keeps the hold locked in. Lesnar powers out. Brian applies a triangle, and at that point, it was pretty much it because Lesnar has an easy position to just fucking dominate from that position. Lesnar powers up, gets Brian in the F five. Covers him for the pin. One, two, three. Brock Lesnar beats Daniel Bryan in a match that was brilliantly put together. This match was fucking great. Was it better than what AJ Styles did last year? No. But this was the absolute best match you could have possibly ever gotten from Daniel Bryan and Brock Lesnar. The only criticism I have of this match is the fact that if this was 2014 Daniel Bryan, this would have been a fucking classic. That is the only thing that I'm heartbroken about that we didn't get to see in 2014. That would have been an absolutely fucking masterpiece. WWE tried to give us the match that we deserved in 2014, but what we got is a heel Daniel Bryan, or the beginning stages of a heel Daniel Bryan, that really the fans didn't completely buy into. So we were given a heel Daniel Bryan against a babyface, or against a heel Brock Lesnar, trying to mount a babyface comeback. You know, it, it, it worked for the most part, but WWE failed to maximize on what truly could have been something special. This match was fucking brilliant. This was a great main event. Was it better than AJ? No. It was not better than what AJ and Brock did last year, but damn, that was a fucking great match and the best match that you could have ever gotten out of Daniel Bryan and Brock Lesnar. Survivor Series, I thought, hit a home run tonight. There were obviously things I did not like about the show, but for the most part, I thought this was a great showing by WWE. I'm excited for Monday Night Raw tomorrow. We'll see what happens going into TLC. See if there's any call-ups. I'm interested to see where they go with Ronda Rousey after she got her ass kicked. It's going to be interesting, man. WWE in 2019, I I, I just have a feeling, and I don't really say anything positive about the main roster, especially lately, but I feel like in 2019, we're we're really going to start the year off strong. And with WWE, you know, having the proper pieces in place with Ronda and Charlotte and Becky and the Horsewomen and a possible Brock Lesnar, you know, dropping the title to someone worthy of being the champion with possible signings that WWE might have underneath, you know, uh, their fingertips with those guys over in Japan possibly coming over. 
WWE will look vastly fucking different in 2019. And Survivor Series was a great show. It, it was not the show that NXT TakeOver War Games was, but for main roster standards, this was the best pay-per-view of 2018. No question. I'm getting out of here, guys. Thank you so much for watching along with me. If you made it up until this point, thank you so very much. If you enjoyed the review, hit that thumbs up. Follow me on Twitter, at JD from NY 206 Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for all notifications and follow me on Patreon, man. Please pledge and support the podcast on Patreon, patreon.com slash JD from NY 206. I'm getting out of here, guys. Thank you so very much. This has been your Survivor Series 2018 review, and I'll see you guys tomorrow with Monday Night Raw coverage, the fallout from Survivor Series 2018. I'm JD, and I'll see you guys tomorrow night.